something, even if you're not planning to plant, you can grab some of your farm. Um, so Jennifer, without further ado, uh, thank you for playing. All right, Chris, am I live? Y'all hear me? Okay. I tried to be really quiet when you said I was live. I was like, oh, great. I'm going to start talking and everybody's going to hear me over Ray. Um, so I am so glad to be back in the home state of Kentucky. Um, while I am dressed in red and my entire wardrobe right now has G-Beef in red, I did drive here in a UK blue truck. So everybody knows where my allegiance lies, especially when it comes to sports, even in bad seasons. Um, so go Cats. Um, as he mentioned, um, I am in South Georgia. I do things a little bit differently there. I have a producer-driven applied research program in Tifton. This says I work with the producers. I try to figure out what questions that they have, and I work at the step right before that, right? So I'm not a basic researcher. I'm a very applied researcher trying to figure out ways that we can better enhance our profitability uh, and the performance for our producers. I am very beef heavy. That is the area that I work predominantly in. Um, and essentially the last 10 years they have laughed at me because uh, the Kentucky girl brought alfalfa back down to the south and I grow crabgrass. So if you don't, if alfalfa is not your area, then, then let's look at and talk about crabgrass. All right. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of Georgia uh, in, in general, this is Atlanta, the big dot here. Um, this is Athens. And the star down here at the bottom is Tifton. So that's where I'm located. I'm about an hour north of the Florida border. Uh, considering that I was raised in tall fescue country, my research was a novel endophyte tall fescue. I have tried to grow it down there. It doesn't work. So we do have an area where fescue is not our problem, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but when we start to think about the hay production in the state of Georgia, our dominant grass hay production is going to be tall fescue or Bermuda grass. Uh, some minor uh, hay options are cool or warm season annuals, and then bahia grass. And I'm sure up here nobody really knows much or cares much about bahia grass. Uh, my colleague in the back from Alabama, Kim Mullinex, it's one of her favorite forages, and I laugh and call it the fescue of the deep south, right? It's one of those that you have a hard time killing it. Not a great hay option, not really good quality. All right. But now when we start to think about hay production in general, and we all are accustomed to talking about tall fescue, the reality in Georgia is that the tall fescue stands are steadily on decline. So our line in the middle here where the sand hill area is, is where fescue was most commonly grown. That's around Eatonton, Macon, you know, the mid part of the state of Georgia before we get into our coastal plains and the Nats if you get into the real deep south area. So I do live in Nat country. But what we're seeing is that our fescue is leaving the state of Georgia. All right, so this means that right now most of our fescue stands that are still surviving and thriving are definitely on the northern part of the state, right there near the Tennessee border, um, and definitely uh, moving, I guess, on out of the state of Georgia. So our dominant hay production and what we're going to talk about primarily today is going to be Bermuda grass. And I know that that's not very common for this part of Kentucky. I grew up 20 minutes away from here, so I understand that even though we tried, Dad tried many times to put Bermuda grass on the farm, we found greater success with Eastern Gamer grass. But the reality is, as that tall fescue line is moving, so is that Bermuda grass line. And so that's something we need to be considering. But we also need to realize that not all Bermuda grass varieties are created equal. So where I'm at in Georgia, we're going to recommend hybrid Bermuda grass, right? This is where it has to be sprigged. You have to bring it in. You have to bring live sprigs in. Uh, you use live material. You don't plant it from a seed option. That's what we do in Georgia. That's where we get our greatest yields and our greatest quality. And even of all the varieties that we have, there's lots of differences in between those hybrid Bermuda grasses. When we looked at this, and this is some older work now uh, that Dennis Hancock and Bill Anderson did several years ago uh, in Tifton, Georgia, but we started to, why do we primarily look at the hybrid Bermuda grasses? When you look at our graph, these are all hybrid Bermuda grass, and then we have our Bahia grass in the middle, and then the, the box in the end are the highest performing at the time seeded Bermuda grass varieties. But now, the caveat from this information is that this is in Tifton, Georgia, where we can successfully grow hybrid Bermuda grasses. 
Seeded Bermuda grasses can be an option. They're just not going to perform as well in that environment. However, they can be an option in Kentucky. So we do see that the Bermuda grass line is moving on up and probably coming to a Kentucky pasture near you very soon, if not already here. All right, if we're not seeing, that's where we're seeing in, in North Georgia is the calls that we get is our Bermuda grass is taking over our fescue. What do we do? This common Bermuda grass is taking over our fescue. So you can fight it or you can find ways to work with it. Now with Bermuda grass, there are several challenges, right? Krista did a great presentation about horse quality hay and those high sugars. We're not worried about high sugars in Bermuda grass, right? No, we're not uh, at all. That is not a big concern. It's going to have moderate forage quality at best. All right, you can make some good Bermuda grass hay, but it's just, it's not a cool season. It is a warm season. Just by the dynamic of the, the type of forage it is, you have limitations as to what you can get from a quality standpoint. We also have a very short production window. Even in the deep south in Georgia, it's about a four month window of production to cut your Bermuda grass hay. Uh, and that's in the hottest months. So it's an opposite flip. My new boss is, uh, was at Ohio State and he kept talking to me about hay production and he kept calling me you know, this time of year. And I'm like, we're not there yet, man. We're not there yet. In the middle of summer, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, we're cutting hay now, right? We're cutting, that, that's not when you're cutting fescue hay. Uh, it has a very high fertility uh, requirement for the greatest production of those hybrid Bermuda grass, lots of nitrogen uh, to get that, that better performance. And then this picture here is actually a farm visit I went on, and you see a lot of thinning. Um, there's a lot of disease pressure and problems in there, but this is potassium deficiency. And while we see in a lot of forages that this is a very common deficiency, and Jimmy, I think you did some great work with cool season forages showing this, it is one of our biggest problems that we see in Bermuda grass fields. And usually by this time, we're, we're having to talk about renovation or how do we get those numbers back up. And that's because our producers often go with the high nitrogen and no potassium application. Uh, so we see this very common. So again, potassium deficiency, uh, we start to have disease pressure when those numbers get low. And then insect pressure. And I love that there's a fall army worm paper, uh, poster here. That's perfect. Uh, we fight it every year. So two years ago when everybody was like, it's all the way up to Ohio. I'm like, hey, we've been fighting this. For Call me, right? Um, I think Lisa Baxter's post on the different pyrethroids for fall army worm was like the most popular thing that came out of Georgia that year. Um, so we get that all the time, as well as the Bermuda grass stem maggot, which has been in the last 10 years a recent pest problem. So there are challenges that we have with Bermuda grass production. So what did I do, right? <laughs> I moved to South Georgia. Dennis Hancock was still in Georgia at the time, and he and America's alfalfa had worked very hard on reintroducing alfalfa back to the Deep South. Right, because it's a big known thing that alfalfa won't grow in Georgia, right? I know it grows well in Kentucky. I've been to Clayton's farm, like I've seen it. I know it grows well here. I know it grows well in Tennessee. What's the difference between, you know, orange and red, right? It can grow in Georgia, but it's a known nomenclature. And so we have been working to bring alfalfa back to the south. And it's really fun when I go give presentations and people say, you're where? And I'm right here. And they're like, there's no alfalfa there. You see that? And it's just because they don't calculate the acreage. We actually have quite a bit of alfalfa, uh, but that's okay. It can be a best kept secret for our producers in Georgia. So what we have found through many on-farm demonstrations, and then once I arrived in Georgia, we ramped up a lot on the research side of the production standpoint, is that when you combine the king of Bermuda grass to the queen of forages, that you have a winning royal combination. So we are finding a way for our producers to consider incorporating alfalfa without having to go whole hog into pure alfalfa production. It's almost a stepping stone into getting back into this great quality product. And we know for sure that it grows. All of these pictures came from producers' farms. These are not our research plots. Uh, so we do have lots of producers that have uh, incorporated into this system. Most of our producers that have started the alfalfa Bermuda grass integration either now have some pure alfalfa stands 
or have significantly increased their acreage. Uh, because they have learned that we've came up with management strategies. We're not worried as much about the alfalfa weevil. We know how to scout and control that. We're not, you know, the nitrogen prices aren't cheap anymore. So alfalfa really has a good time to shine right now. The other key thing, and, and Joe Bouton and I got into a long conversation about this, the original person to put alfalfa into Bermuda grass was Glenn Burton years ago, right? And he's the godfather of Bermuda grass. He bred so many varieties of Bermuda grass down in Georgia, and he did this work years ago. But when you look at what our university recommendations are from a quality standpoint of coastal Bermuda, which would be a hybrid Bermuda grass hay, versus our maintenance of our alfalfa stands, and you start to look across through here, the difference is this 200 to 400 pounds of nitrogen per acre that's required for that Bermuda grass, right? You start to look at your P and K requirements, and they're very similar. So what we do by integrating alfalfa into that Bermuda grass is we eliminate that nitrogen component. Now we have producers that start listening, right? They start to listen up, and they're like, hey, what about that? And then we extend the season. So we go from four cuttings to, in some cases, we're cutting eight or more cuttings a year. Now, some producers don't like that. They don't want to be on a tractor that much. But So when we looked at the two things here, and again, this is from America's alfalfa, and you see the growth curve of alfalfa production and the growth curve of Bermuda grass production, we find that in this combination, we have a very good marriage between the two, right? Because we don't have them competing when our alfalfa production goes into that summer slump and slows down, that's when our Bermuda grass production ramps up. And so now you're filling in that yield gap that you have in the middle of the season. But we also look at, these are our just standard numbers for our Tipton 85 Bermuda grass, which is our highest quality option right now. Uh, and you see, you know, crude protein, 14%, that's something good, but that's if you're getting it cut on that 28-day interval, you're getting it exactly right. We have weather in South Georgia. You're not always going to get that with your Bermuda grass. So what are our advantages when you add alfalfa into Bermuda grass? You're going to get an increased yield per unit area, right? Increased cuttings, increased yield, because something's growing on that area outside of just that four-month window. You have an increased quality as soon as you add that alfalfa into the mixture, which then results in a decrease in the supplementation for your animals. Now, another thing that we have to think about with alfalfa production, and it's decreased nationwide, is because a lot of our dairy farmers have gotten away from using alfalfa, and a lot of our beef farmers just haven't used alfalfa. Well, now when you get into the alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture, we'll see some quality numbers in a little bit, you're meeting the needs for those beef animals. So no longer is it the thought that we don't need to use it so much for beef. It's here is a great option for our beef animals, and most of our producers uh, actually, Kim and I think we were talking about this earlier on the way up here. We've got three producers that started, I'm going to make alfalfa Bermuda for the horse hay market, got into a pinch, made some baleage, fed it that winter to their animals, and they're like, no, no, I'm growing my own feed. I'm finishing my animals out. This is what I'm doing. Now I, now I have a completely closed system. You know, I'll grow some other alfalfa over there for the horse hay market, but we're going to use this for our, our beef cattle. You extend that land use. It really helps us to fill in some of the forage gaps, especially that we see uh, in South Georgia. And if all else fails in this system, you still have something. So if you plant your alfalfa and it's too deep, or it's a bad year, you have bad weather, the Bermuda grass is still there, right? You still have something. So then that's like your insurance policy when you go into this type of mixture. From specifically to our hay production standpoint, we do see a decrease in the dry down time compared to alfalfa production alone. Part of that is because in that mixture, that Bermuda grass is lifting that alfalfa off of the ground, and you're seeing that it's going to help to slow or to increase, decrease the dry, it's going to dry down quicker <laughs> than in your alfalfa production alone, going to be a little bit longer than that Bermuda grass. That's just the difference in the characteristics of those two, uh, two, two forage species. Uh, but you do have increased airflow. And then you see improved leaf retention because you're not having to wait as long before you can get in there and harvest that crop. Now, equipment does matter. Uh, we did some work using some different uh, rakes, and we do see that you have an increased ash content when you use a V or a wheel rake versus using a rotary rake. And 
They laugh at me because I'm not an equipment person. So it's this one versus this one. All right, this one, less ash content. Uh, but it's not a, a guarantee. It's not something you have to have. We've used all kinds of equipment trying to get started here. Uh, but we would prefer if we had the option the rotary rig as well as using a mower conditioner is going to be recommended. Uh, and if you're specific for alfalfa, we want that roller type uh, because it, you gotta, you know, you're going to go in and crunch those uh, to decrease that di drying time again, get, that, get it to dry down a lot faster. Uh, we use a flail type. It does knock more leaves off, right? But if you were in a situation where you're buying brand new equipment, because we're always doing that, right, this is what we're going to recommend. Now, why do we really like this? It's because of that ebb and flow relationship. And I've talked about the length of that growing season. After our first year, we start harvest in March, and we will harvest to October or November every four weeks. All right, so you're increasing that time. But we really see a good ebb and flow relationship. Those first few cuttings are going to be dominant in alfalfa with a little bit of ryegrass or Bermuda grass mixed in. When you get into those June, July cuttings, those are going to have more of that Bermuda grass, August is going to be dominant Bermuda grass, September and October, you start to see it flow back into that alfalfa production. Uh, so you see a really good mixture there, and that's a good way to be able to market your product that you're making. Uh, so again, uh, with the work that we've done with America's alfalfa, we have been seeing a lot of demonstrations and increase uh, of on-farm work where we're working with producers uh, to integrate into this system, and obviously a lot of that has happened uh, in Georgia from the work that Dr. Hancock started and, and we are continuing throughout the state. All right, so you can't talk about forages without talking about the weather, right? Is that, that's like a, a requirement. You can't, can't have an extension talk without saying take a soil test. Uh, so here is, our, is a five-year range of our uh, rainfall that we had in Tifton, Georgia. And the thing that I want to point out here is that there's no such thing as an average year for us, right? And then also certain years, you see these big spikes. It's like, man, y'all got that much rain in August. Uh, those are called hurricanes. Yeah, talk about, talk about a Kentucky girl moving to hurricane country. My husband enjoys, because hurricanes last forever, y'all. They last forever. You prepare for like a week, and like, I'm used to tornadoes. It's here, it's gone, you deal with it, right? No, 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 hurricanes. Uh, so it, it does throw off some of your data when you look at that and you say, well, you all had a really wet, uh, really wet year there in August. Well, no, we really didn't. Uh, we had to harvest as quick as we could right after a drought because we weren't going to be able to get back into that field for quite some time. So we decided to bring on the baleage. All right, we've extended the use of our, our system in our Bermuda grass, which is normally in a dry season, into March, right? And in March, we're getting timely rains usually so what are other opportunities that we can consider for our producers? And baleage production is one of those. So baleage has become a southeastern game changer. It helps us to really minimize that weather effect. And we're finding that it works great and it's economic for alfalfa Bermuda grass systems. Uh, steal the work from the numbers. It doesn't pay off for Bermuda grass production alone. Uh, but if you already have the equipment, then that's when you consider doing it for Bermuda grass. Um, lots of our producers are starting to embrace this after the few wet years. Uh, 2013 was one of the wettest years we had on record. It was funny because it was my first year as an extension specialist and I was prepared to talk about drought. And it was wet. And then we had terrible hay. It was like 12 week old, 12 and 14 week hole before you could get in. And then by the following year, we had cattle, then as we best described it, dying on a full stomach because the fiber content of that was so high that they weren't able to digest it. So they would just eat and eat and eat and just get full and it wouldn't go through the system and these animals would get impacted and die. So producers then after that year have started to kind of embrace some of this Baelish technology and we haven't seen as many of those issues, which is a great thing uh, to consider. So one of the first projects that I implemented when I got to Tifton was an alfalfa Bermuda grass as Baelish where we did a comparison of Tifton 85, the king of Bermuda grass, uh, with or without alfalfa integrated. The alfalfa variety we used was Bulldog 805. It is a UGA developed variety. It is a semi to non-dormant variety. Uh, so we can use this almost year round, uh, depending on what our seasons are. 
Uh, this past year at Christmas was the first time we've had freezing temperatures. Uh, before that, I had to adjust to 80 degrees on, temp on Christmas. It's terrible, y'all. 80 degrees at Christmas is terrible. Uh, we also modified the establishment and management. A lot of this was work that was previously done, uh, but we have determined that the best way to intercede this is on a 14-inch row spacing. Uh, you'll see that we use 20 pounds an acre for this particular project. We've actually bumped that back to 12 to 15 pounds to the acre. Uh, with the 14-inch row spacing, you're using every other hole in your seed drill, not every single hole. Uh, when you go with the 7-inch row spacing, if you get a good alfalfa stand, you will shade out your Bermuda grass. If you go with a 20-inch row spacing, even if you get a good alfalfa stand, that Bermuda grass is going to take it over. Our sweet spot seems to be in that every other hole area. That's where you start to get that, that ebb and flow. So uh, we have perfected that. We harvest just like you would any other alfalfa system. After that first harvest, we're going to go with a 10% bloom, 28 to 35 day interval. So nothing really changes in that aspect. Uh, for our baleage production systems, everybody talks about hay in a day. Uh, we actually are cutting in the evenings right before uh, dark. That's because your sugar contents are greatest. I know you don't want sugar, but I want all of it. Uh, you get that sugar content great, helps with that fermentation process. Then the next morning we go in, we start testing that moisture. As soon as we hit 55%, that's our go time into the field, and we have it all wrapped by the next afternoon. So it is 24 hours, uh, but we aren't doing it all in one single day. Uh, so this, again, from that work, we're looking at the botanical composition of this mixture. Uh, I will say that I started in January, so this is a spring-planted uh, alfalfa into the mixture. Uh, we do not recommend spring planting. We'll have some data to show that. Uh, but you'll see our first year, we kind of had a yield lag in that alfalfa production. We didn't even get to that 30% or greater stand. Uh, but we had harvest, we still had six harvests in, in, our, in our first year, in our, seed, in our seeding year. Uh, and then we got to eight harvests in our second year, and I think seven there in our third year. And after our first year, we got that greater than 30% stand that we're looking for. In every pro project that we have established, everybody always asks about nitrogen. We do one nitrogen application, uh, 50 units of ammonium sulfate about this time of year just to kick things off right as we're going into our first harvest, and then we don't put nitrogen on the system again. Uh, so that's been a, a wonderful thing to look at. But you do see that ebb and flow relationship here. We have our dominance of our alfalfa early in the season. Uh, the uh, red here is our Bermuda grass. And then you see a lot of the other. Well, the other is crabgrass. All right, it's a natural beast that we fight in alfalfa and Bermuda grass systems, just like it is in an alfalfa system. Uh, but if you're already working in a mixture and you already have a high quality weed that's adding to your group, why well, call it a weed? Call it a pretty good forage. So the results of this, uh, we did see that there was an advantage to the mixture over Bermuda grass alone. Uh, in our total number of harvests, we saw an increase at the total non, uh, tonnage per acre produced annually, an increase, and then when we looked at our forage quality. I will point out where you see this 12% crude protein, this is not, or 12 and 14, this is not what you would expect uh, in an alfalfa Bermuda grass system. This right here is what you expect when you get a spring establishment. Right, because those early cuttings, you don't have really strong alfalfa. Uh, but after that, you're getting 22 and 21. You're making rocket fuel right there is the point that you're not having to add a lot of supplement for your beef animals. Uh, so I won't go on and on. We do have uh, all of our manuscripts from these projects that are available as open access publications. Uh, it's in the links are in your uh, um, proceedings there, and you can find us. We can send you this information. So all of it is available. Although. although I mean, they're manuscripts, so I don't know that anybody wants to read those. Uh, the next question our producers gave us is, what if we don't want to do alfalfa? What about another legume option? Uh, in our area, it is very common for producers to overseed their Bermuda grass with winter annual mixtures, um, annual ryegrass, and crimson clover. Uh, the problem with a lot of those is the annual clovers are uh, one and done, right? They come in, they produce, they're done. And so I started talking to some of my colleagues in um, Florida that have been working with some biennial clover options. Uh, and um, one, another Kentucky uh, raised, uh, Ken Questenberry, who's now in Florida, has been doing a lot of work with red clover. Again, bringing my Kentucky roots, right? Red clover's everywhere up here. 
why don't we incorporate red clover back into the deep south? And so we started doing some work with Barduro red clover in those stands that were Bermuda grass only. We added red clover following the same uh, establishment that we did with the alfalfa, the 14 inch row spacing, all of those things to see about that as an option. We were pretty impressed with the red clover. Um, my uh, uh, beef manager says, I want more of this. The animals play king of the bell on it. Uh, and when you start to look at the quality comparisons to our alfalfa Bermuda, red clover is a high quality legume, very comparable from a quality standpoint. Uh, in 2019, we went into a severe drought. This picture was in July. Uh, and then in 2020, this picture was in July. So we were swimming in legumes in 2020. 2020 was a bad year for lots of other things, right? There was like a pandemic and all that. But it was a great year for forage production in South Georgia. Uh, so when we start to compare this, again, uh, like I said, my producers were asking, could it be comparable to alfalfa? So I do have to point out that while you look at the tonnage and it's, it looks like it's kind of close, this is year four and five and a significant drought year uh, for the alfalfa production versus red clover planted each year. All right, so you have to keep that in mind from a comparison standpoint. If you looked at years one, two, and three yields from the alfalfa Bermuda, the tonnage would far outweigh what the red clover did, but it's still a good option. We also had red clover contributing each year all the way into August. So this becomes another legume options that we have forgotten about in the Deep South, but something that we definitely should consider incorporating. From a quality standpoint, uh, they were, there were essentially no differences in our quality. So our conclusions from this is that red clover is definitely something to consider. But if you look at this thick stand, again, this was in July, which is, was unexpected for all of us. Uh, but you see a lot of red clover, but not a lot of Bermuda grass. So the difference in this is you're not going to get that ebb and flow that you're looking for. You actually get significant shading from that red clover, even on that 14 inch row spacing. Just the way that it grows with that large leaf area. And so for our producers, we're considering this potentially more in a pasture situation. And we're even looking at it trying to improve the hay grass. Oh, that's a whole other challenge though. Uh, but it is something that is that producers could consider as an option and really something that now we have people that are incorporating it into their systems that they'd kind of forgotten about as being an option in general. So the question is how long will alfalfa last in our baleage systems? Uh, we harvested this out again uh, with both of those studies. That was five years. In 2021, we kept collecting some of the data on it. Uh, and so we got past that five-year window. Uh, we're actually asking the question now is what's the next step? Because with pure alfalfa production, we know that after year five, you either incorporate, reg or incorporate orchard grass to get a couple more years, or you start the conversion process. But if you have a Bermuda grass base, you don't want to convert that, right? Because that's your perennial that's there. So you're not going to go in and completely change that. We've done some preliminary work. We hoped that on that 14 inch row spacing as that stand thinned, that we could be able to plant into that and autotoxicity would not be a problem. Guess what, it is. So autotoxicity still occurs in this system. We're not gonna be able to uh, eliminate that even though it's in a mixture. So now we're doing some work to see how far out can you kill it and then reestablish into it. Are you gonna have to wait a full year? And how do we even kill it out? Uh, and not kill our Bermuda grass. So those are some of the questions that we have. Although a lot of our producers are also looking at the dual use system that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So it may be that that area converts into a pasture for a little while until the alfalfa stand decreases so significantly that it's not contributing anymore to autotoxicity. Uh, talking about our establishment, as I said, we do it a little bit differently down there. Uh, if you're establishing alfalfa in Kentucky, are you doing it in spring or fall? Clayton, do you establish in spring or fall? fall? Fall, all right, that's good. So I have lots of producers that talk to me and they say, it was just too wet or too dry and I just couldn't get it in the fall. Should I do it in the spring? Have we done it? Yes. Do we recommend it? No. And so we have an active project right now and two of the, two of the questions in this project are one, spring or fall establishment, and two, what if we leave the crabgrass alone, right? What happens? Now, in this, we are doing some plot work, but we are looking at it from a pasture establishment standpoint, right? So in a pasture situation, you're not real worried about crabgrass, or you don't have to worry so much about crabgrass. Uh, so these are two projects, again, in Tifton. We also have sister projects in North Georgia and two in Tennessee. Tennessee, they're doing it with tall fescue and orchard grass. Both the work in Tennessee and Georgia with tall fescue 
we are having a greater challenge establishing alfalfa into fescue. It works better the other way around if you do the fescue into the alfalfa. Uh, some of that's going to be the cool season, warm season mixture, right? Some, and the other is that if you can grow pure alfalfa very well without having some of the challenges that we have, you're better to add after to thicken that stand up than you are to start at the front. But we do have some producers, if you start from establishing novel endophyte fescue and alfalfa together at seeding, you can get some good success. So we did have some challenges there. Uh, but for our Bermuda grass alfalfa, we have two, we call them location one and two. This is a year one and two. Uh, both of these are establishment and then we're taking them out to two and three years just to see how they perform. Uh, but it's kind of obvious when you start to look at it, our real thick stands right here, those are our fall established treatments. We have fall established, spring established, and then we added crabgrass into the mixture. Uh, but it, the data clearly shows fall is the way to go. Uh, and so from year one, we saw that you by far had better success from a yield standpoint with that fall establishment over that spring establishment. And year two, while our yields were much suppressed because we planted in a drought and we stayed in a drought in the past year, we still saw that greater success with the fall establishment. Uh, so now we have the numbers to put back behind that we are going to recommend the fall establishment. Uh, also, even in some of our other work, you never catch up from that spring establishment. Like you start low and you, it just never catches up to the performance of those stands where we have our fall establishment. But it's because you're not allowing for that root growth and those carbohydrates to really get that plant going while the Bermuda grass is dormant and not competing. So when you plant it in the spring, you're starting it right into a competition. Uh, so this is some ongoing work um, right now with, uh, with one of my master's students. She's working on writing up her conclusions. But the results from this, uh, we did find fall is the way we're going to recommend. Also, crabgrass persistence may be a way for us to save a little bit of money and labor in our system, especially if you're looking at a baleage system. Now, I understand in a hay production system, crabgrass is a beast to dry down. Like, we get it. We have guys that do crabgrass hay, and sometimes by the time you dry it down to be hay, you don't have anything but stems left. So I, I understand those challenges there. But if you're in a baleage system or a pasture system where you're already working with a high moisture crop, it's really not having a negative impact on our quality of that stand. So maybe it's a way for us to reduce some of those input costs by not having to put so many applications of pre-emergent weed control out. Um, so then the other work that we looked at, uh, because I am a grazer by heart, uh, is we looked at grazing the alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures. And this is one of the fun things, especially when I go to areas outside of the deep south and we talk about grazing alfalfa and I get these funny looks like, you're doing what? And I'm like, yeah, but you know, you harvest hay at night and we have humidity all year long. So it's differences, right? It's differences in the system. But we're lucky that the varieties that have been developed in Georgia are dual use varieties. Joe Bouton did a significant amount of work with that uh, in the 80s. Uh, Ray Smith was involved with some of that. Um, but to find varieties that can actually withstand some of this grazing pressure in, uh, that are provided by our grazing animals. Uh, so one of the first projects we did is, again, we did a comparison of alfalfa Bermuda to Bermuda grass alone and Bermuda grass with nitrogen in the deep south in a stalker production system. Year one, we had good timely rains, great weather. We got 122 days of grazing from May to September, so that's a really good uh, window to be looking at from a production standpoint. In year two, as I talk about those spikes in the graph, uh, my PhD start, student on the project started. It rained his first day, and then it rained the last day of the project, and it did not rain anywhere in between. So we still got 87 days of grazing, uh, but we learned some stuff in this system uh, significantly. The other thing that we looked at is our producers like to focus on average daily gain, but average daily gain isn't the most important thing when you're looking at herd management. And so while we didn't see, we saw some differences, but not really big differences in our average daily gain with our system that had alfalfa, what we did see is big differences in the gain per hectare and the overall stocking rate. We were consistently stocking that mixture higher than our Bermuda grass, even our Bermuda grass that had nitrogen in it. Uh, so that so showed us that it was a real win for the system. And then again, you had significantly higher uh, quality in that mixture than you did in the, the Bermuda grass alone. So our conclusions, hey, it's a viable option. We should consider looking further into this, not just keep this as a stored forage product, 
but maybe we should consider this in our grazing systems. However, in that study, our rest periods were not long enough. Uh, this is one of those new young researchers and you have a limited amount of space situation. We did three rotations, so we only allowed up to 20 days of rest. 20 days of rest can work in good weather, but as soon as you hit that drought, 20 days was too soon and, and we ended up taking a lot of the alfalfa out. So we knew that cutting it, past or cutting it shorter than 28 days, not going to be something that we recommend. Again, this paper just uh, got published uh, this the beginning of the, the year, uh, December, so the, the end of last year, uh, and, and it is available open access. Uh, so our work in Georgia has shown that alfalfa Bermuda grass systems work well in baleage production. Uh, they work well in a grazing system, uh, but we have to come up with what these best management practices are for the system longevity in general as well as what can best match our production systems for our producers, especially uh, in the Deep South. So this led into a project that we started in 2019, right, Kim? 2019. Uh, we have sister locations in Tifton, Georgia, and in Headland, Alabama. And we're looking at three different defoliation strategies under, um, in the southeast in an area that is right next to each other. So I'm going to describe that just a little bit. We have three treatments. So we have a grazing treatment. We do a clean off cut. Then we go in and we graze for as long as that stand will sustain grazing without killing the stand out completely. Uh, we go in and we cut. And so we harvest it as a hay or baleage product depending on weather. Again, as long as, and we want to allow for that rest, usually ending in November. And then we have what we call the cut and graze or a dual use system. In the first two years of this project, we clean off cut, started grazing about 21 days after, and we go into a rotational grazing system. Then we would pull them off into the summer slump, so we're not really pushing that alfalfa when it's the highest stress. Uh, we would harvest baleage in the, in the summer months, and then we did what we called stockpile grazing. You know about stockpiling in Kentucky, right? We're bringing all that Kentucky stuff way down to South Georgia. Uh, but Kim Mullenix and I had done some work at Auburn stockpiling Bermuda grass, Tifton 85 Bermuda grass, and it worked very successful. So why not consider this with the alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture? We know we don't recommend stockpiling legumes, all right? We understand that we don't recommend that because of the leaf shatter after the frost, but until this year, in our environment, we can't guarantee that killing frost that is key for stockpiling production. So even though we're calling it stockpiling, it's more a deferred grazing because you're still getting some growth and regrowth in that system. And so we would go into our stockpile grazing starting October 1st and then see how long it would sustain. Surprisingly, in year two, I ended the study at Christmas just to be nice to my student, right? <laughs> because he was like, You've, I, we've been doing this for, let's see, April, May, June, all year. Can I, come on, can we end this study now? Uh, so this is a, a good aerial view that Dr. Lisa Baxter took for us so that you can really see the magnitude of this project. Uh, it is very uncommon to have projects, even to have access to this much acres to do this type of work. Uh, this is one of our baleage treatments. Uh, this is one of our grazing treatments where we graze, we rotate it every uh, seven days to get that 28 days of regrowth. You can see the animals are here. They had just left in this area. Uh, really good visuals that we see. This is at the what we call the Better Grazing Program in Tifton. Uh, and then we have treatments that would be our dual use. In, th in this particular system right now, they are actively in the grazing state of the dual use. Uh, just to get a better view of this, this is our four uh, rotations for active grazing. Uh, so this would be in the spring to summer months, seven days in each section, and then they would move on. And then we have our stockpiling system. This one is actually on Russell Bermuda grass. So in Tifton, we're looking at Russell and Tifton 85 Bermuda grass to look at the performance in different systems. Uh, but you can see that we went through, and on this system, we rotated every two to three days, uh, and we adjusted the area. So for the first system, we adjusted the stocking, and the second system, we adjusted the area uh, using temporary fencing technology. All right, so when we get into the data, uh, again, like I said, in Tifton, we have both Russell and 85, so you may see some stuff that says R and T. That's just looking at the different varieties. It's not real significant right now to talk about. Uh, but we saw that in the first year, regardless of our use, we got 112 days total use out of it. 
This is an establishment year. We established in fall. You're not going to get used out of that system really until that May window for that clean off cut. Uh, and then we didn't want to push it much past that November timeline because we really wanted to let for that, that stand to really develop. Uh, you can see that there are differences in when the system was used, uh, but they all somehow turned out to be 112 days. You couldn't ask for that good of, of data if you tried. Uh, but then in the second year, that's where we start to see a little bit of separation. Again, we got 180 days of use out of these systems. You know, that's when you start to talk about these 300-day systems of forage production. We get close to 300 days of forage production where we're at in, in Georgia. We can almost have something green year-round. Uh, way down in, in South Georgia. So when we look at our baleage data, again, this is combined data over two years of data collection. Uh, and so we have, these, this would be our cut system with the green lines with all, uh, and then this would be our cut and graze system. Uh, obviously, you can't compare seasonal yield production because you only cut it three times uh, in the cut and graze system. Uh, we do see that in June you're going to have a lower yield in that cutting, but you have to think about if you came off of rotational grazing and then you go back into that two and a half acres, as you wait for it to get to stage of production, you're going to have some fluctuations in that, that particular cutting, right, because different use on that particular area. Uh, but by the time we got into our July cutting, that's going to be your uniform cut. Uh, we had comparable yields there. Uh, and then again in August, uh, you started to see some of that impact. That's going to just be from the stress that you have in alfalfa in general. Uh, and we don't have as much stress in our cutting system versus if you were grazing in that time period. You get into a drought and you're continually removing that material, you're starting to impact that stand versus just let it sit and wait. When we looked at our grazing data, this is where you see some of that Russell and Tifton 85. We really didn't see a lot of difference in our variety, um, but th we did see... Uh, our significant difference that we see is the um, amount or days of, of use, the total days of use. Uh, in year two, uh, we were able to graze longer in those mixtures that had Tifton 85. This is where varietal differences really come in. Uh, Russell produces early in the season, and then in September, it's done. It's shut down, and it's not, it's not worried about doing anything else. 85 will continue to grow as long as you're in that 80-degree area. South Georgia, we stay in 80 degrees a lot of times. Anybody come down to the Sunbelt Ag Expo in October, you never know what the weather's going to be like, but it's usually pretty warm. And so, uh, again, we were able to graze uh, our 85 also all the way to Christmas. So that is a significant impact for our producers if you're looking for fitting that window, and that's kind of where I work at, is how do we fit the window from September to November, December, when we're waiting for our winter annuals to grow and our, our warm seasons are done. What can we do? And now we're starting to fill in that gap. Uh, when we started to look at our quality, obviously our cutting is going to have our highest quality. Uh, our grazing has a little bit lower quality. That's variations across the season because this is compiled across the whole season and two years. So when you get into some of those drought stress situations, that alfalfa component decreases, uh, but still not going to scoff at any of those numbers from an animal production standpoint. So then how do you compare this kind of stuff? And this is where we get into the statistical analysis. And if you look at this as a normal graph, you would say, well, cutting is the best way to go. That is easy to see, right? Uh, but actually what we were looking at is how do we optimize this system, right? And so uh, our economist is actually working on combining the data to give us the economic numbers. But to optimize the system, you actually look at the cut and graze system. Because with the cut and graze system, now you can target your highest quality cuttings and then you can use it as grazing in windows when you don't have grazing. All right, so if we are cutting our alfalfa Bermuda grass March, April, May, because our producers are grazing an abundance of annual ryegrass, which is high quality, March, April, May, now we have a high quality feed source for when they don't have something great to graze. And then when we adjust it and we start grazing September and we graze September, October to however long, now we have fit a window where our producers don't have any great options to graze. So we are finding how this system can really uh, be optimized. Uh, obviously, if you're in pure hay production or pure baleish production, that system works great. Definitely something uh, that we are t seeing a, a benefit to. 
But a lot of our producers uh, do have cattle, are looking for ways to, to optimize that, and maybe they don't want to spend that much time on a tractor. So that has led to our current project, again, at both locations in Alabama and Georgia. Uh, and we are, again, doing the system where we talked about rest, baleage production, uh, and then we go into our grazing in September. All right, so I think that is all I have. So questions? Oh, you have to, you have to be like Ray. Uh, we do have production guides. This is another uh, NAFA publication, National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance publication. Uh, one of the requests that we have from a lot of our producers is we have alfalfa production guides for our states. We didn't have anything specific to alfalfa Bermuda grass. Uh, so these are alfalfa Bermuda grass production guys for the south. Uh, and then this is a handy dandy little calendar uh, to where you kind of look at, okay, what month is it? What are things that we should consider? Uh, as well as just kind of a getting started guide. Uh, and then listening to both the county agents and our producers, we made this in dashboard size. All right, there are these out on the table. Take them home. I'm not taking them home with me. All right, so put them on your, on your dashboard, have those up there, and, and maybe it's something that you could consider or pass along to a friend to consider as well. Yes, sir. Oh, no, no, weeds are not a problem. No, uh, so the, the only really good option we have for weed control is pre-emergent. Uh, so we use Prowl H2O four times across the season, three times in the more northern part of the state, uh, just because our long growing season, we usually hit a fourth application. Uh, mostly that's going to control your annual ryegrass, your crabgrass. Uh, so some years we've missed it. We're not really seeing a big problem with those actually contributing to our system because uh, you're already working into a mixture. Uh, it's one of those that people refer to them as weeds, depending on where they're located. They're high quality forages. Um, other weeds that we have seen uh, problems with pigweed. So where I'm located is cotton and peanut country, which was definitely a shock for me because you know I grew up in corn and soybean country. Uh, but cotton and peanuts, there's lots of Roundup resistant uh, weeds uh, and, and pigweed that's in the area. So we do see some of that. Uh, that we kind of have a challenge to control. Uh, but, you know, if we can get our timely applications, it, it tends to work out well. Uh, I didn't talk about variety specifically. Um, we, most of our work has been with 805. Uh, that field right there is actually a pure stand of Roundup Ready um, alfalfa that we put in, uh, Roundup Ready 600 RR, still a dual use variety. Uh, so we are trying to do some pure stand production for, to target our hay and baleage producers. Um, in the mixture system, I, at first I didn't see any benefit at all to Roundup Ready because we want the other things in the mixture. Uh, after several years and, and, and things that we've learned, it helps from the establishment standpoint for that winter weed control uh, because you can spray Roundup on dormant Bermuda grass and it not impact your Bermuda grass stand negatively and then control the, the ryegrass and some of those other things that break through. I have a producer that he actually went into his field and he did half 805, half Roundup Ready. And, you know, if you're selling Roundup Ready alfalfa, you need to talk to him because he is all about it. He says that's the way to go, uh, even at the increased cost. Yes, sir? Insecticide. So our insecticide applications don't change that much from Bermuda grass in general. Uh, so we had this time of year, we, we saw that we had uh, weevil damage last week. Uh, and so we'll do one application of a pyrethroid for that. And usually that takes care of our weevil problem. Uh, we see three-cornered leaf hopper. So we don't see a lot of potato leaf hopper, but we see the three-cornered leaf hopper uh, in the summer months. Um, but with Bermuda grass, especially where we're located, the Bermuda grass stem maggot uh, is a problem. And once you start getting that, you have to do uh, bi-weekly applications of that. So we're not doing it as frequent as you do the stem maggot. Uh, but we still have about the same amount of, of applications across the season. So I would say roughly six applications a year, uh, always pyrethroid with the exception of our army worm. So the end of the year, we'll do a pyrethroid usually around August, uh, pyrethroid, we'll do Prevathon usually around August to get that residual control going into that September month. Uh, and that's just the only one on fall army worm that has any kind of residual impact. 
So it doesn't change that. that that's the good thing in, in the system is it doesn't change much from what our Bermuda grass producers are already doing. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.